Hello, my name is Terry Kylo from Paths to Understanding. And I'm John Hale, representing Northwest Interfaith. We want to say a quick thank you to Jeffrey Steele for the beautiful music that he shared. You can hear his music at jeffreysteele.com with no extra E in the name. I'll put that in the chat here in just a few moments. We're so excited that you're joining us for Hear Me, Stand With Me. As you log on, we would ask that you use the chat feature to announce at least your first name and what you hope for in this webinar. Racism and prejudice harm people of many groups and divide us from one another. Often we don't fully appreciate the challenges that various groups are facing and so fail to work together for our common good. Hear Me Stand With Me is an opportunity to hear the struggle of many groups <clears throat> through story, poetry, music, and art and learn what it means to stand with that group to create a better life for all of us. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that all of us are currently standing on the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples. And we honor with gratitude the land itself and the Coast Salish peoples themselves. We are all in this together and our futures are inseparably bound up with one another. We don't just wanna hear these stories, we want to get directly connected with each other to actively stand with each other to create a better world. We begin this series with Black and Indigenous communities. We look forward to listening to LGBTQ, Jewish, Muslim, Ahmadiyya, Sikh, Latinx, and Asian American communities, and more as we co-create future opportunities. This event is sponsored by Northwest Interfaith, Paths to Understanding, the Interfaith Community Sanctuary, Call of Compassion Northwest, Circles of Color, and Sky Urban Empowerment and Transformation Center. If you'd like to offer some financial support for these events, we are posting a link for that in the comments section. There are two parts of this meeting. First, a webinar, where we will hear some of the lived experience of people harmed by racism and prejudice, learning what we can all do to stand together, a presentation on what it means to be an active partner. We will engage in a spiritual practice, and then we'll have about a five minute break or we move from a Zoom webinar to a Zoom meeting. And we'll give you that link both in an email and in the chat feature. In the Zoom meeting itself, we're gonna have a breakout sessions to reflect together, a breakout session to get connected to leaders of each group, a time to name our own commitment moving forward, and also a spiritual practice. Again, we are so excited to have you here. We encourage you to stand and stretch during this experience and take two breaks or bio breaks as you need, we will be doing the same. Our first group is led by Reverend Linda Smith of the Sky Urban Empowerment Network, working with Joseph Todd. Reverend Dr. Linda Smith is a preacher, speaker, author, life coach, consultant, spiritual director, and founder and executive director of the Sky Urban Empowerment and Transformation Center. He has received many honors and awards, which include Outstanding Citizen of the Year from Renton, Patron of the Year, again from Renton Foundation, and the Women of Influence Award, among other, among other opportunities. Joseph Todd is the Chief Information Officer of the City of Tukwila and was previously Senior IT Manager leading collaboration services at Alaska Airlines and a senior manager at the Boeing Company where he spent 15 years and held several leadership roles. Joseph serves in leadership at New Beginning Christian Fellowship in Kent, Washington and is chairperson of Renton Residence for Change. Linda and Joseph, we are so appreciative that you are here with us. How can we best hear you and stand with you? Great. Well, good afternoon, and, and thank you for having us uh, join you this afternoon. I am delighted to uh, join my esteemed colleague, colleague, Joseph Todd, to talk about a very important issue um, uh, to us in, in, in the Black community, and that is to address the issue around um, racism. And so we, we want to begin today to talk about our own personal journey 
and the experiences that we've had in life and how those experiences continue to play itself out and the um, impact that it has had on our, our, our race as a whole, but us individually as people in our communities and our families across a broad spectrum of issues. So I'm just going to tell a little bit about my story uh, and then I'll turn it over to Joseph because um, I grew up sort of like in the civil rights era. So I had the experience of, of um, you know, hearing the voices of the Dr. Martin Luther Kings and advocating for justice. And it just in 2020, as I think about it, is so many of the issues that uh, we were experiencing then, we're still experiencing now. So I believe the topic and the conversation that we engage in today is really important. And so my own personal journey of, 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 of racism is, is really, I'm gonna tell you the short side of the story because we would be here much too long. So I, my family, um, I was born in a family of 11. And so we grew up on, uh, on farmer's land and um, really experienced some deep uh, struggles uh, and encounters. And as I look back at those, those issues, or even as I, I think when I was growing up, we didn't really hear a lot about racism. We just knew that we were being uh, treated differently and unfairly and we had to struggle a lot. But as I look back at it through the lens of, of racism, um, and, and, and try to dissect it and look at the various components. Some of the things that we were affected by was education. Um, you know, going to high school, I, I went to school in an all black school and, um, and there was a white school across the street. Of course, we got the leftover books from the white school with the pages torn out. And so the only thing that we ever heard about in terms of careers were farming and agricultural jobs. And so, um, there was nothing ever really there to inspire us to see anything greater. Uh, we, my family experienced a lot of homelessness. And so that's why homelessness is really dear to me now. Uh, at, at one point, our family, the only place that my dad could find for us to live was in a barn. Uh, and so, you know, that was a very uh, traumatic experience. Um, economically, um, you know, we never had the ability to be able to gain economic access because we were working actually on the farm and what uh, the financial resources that my father received at the end of the year was a couple of bags of beans and some salt pork and rice to carry us over through the winter. And, and um, experience you know, with my health care, I recall one time that I was ill and my mother took me to the doctor. And one of the things that uh, I remember was I had a, a very high temperature and was told that we had to sit in the back of the office until all the white people had been served. Well, that ended up being an eight hour day because my mother took me there about eight o'clock in the morning. And it wasn't until about uh, 4.30 that they finally got around to seeing me. And I, I'm gonna stop at that because I, I just wanted to give a, a taste of, of, of the impact of racism that it has on us uh, spiritually, emotionally, and, and psychologically. And so, um, I, I believe to what today is about is really helping us to that, see those experiences and, and how those experiences impact our lives. And, but more importantly, as, as um, Terry alluded to in the beginning is how do we move forward collectively as a group? Because in the midst of all those struggles, there's also some amazing stories that I can tell later on about how collectively people coming together, why, and others coming together to help us to be able to overcome some of those, those struggles. So thank you for just hearing a little bit of what um, I have to say, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Joseph and then I'll be back at, at a later point. Uh, thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, um, what I really wanna say before I uh, start talking about my experiences is that um, I really honor the experience that you had and and how it's put me and others that have come along later in a better position because we're standing on your shoulders, right? Because you in, you endured those tough things and powered through them and and pushed through and and in your activism has changed our experience um, much greater than the experience that you had. I just want to honor that and I and I really thank you for the for persevering through that. And, and pushing things forward. And so, 
so as I transition from that, um, my experience, I'm going to weave in how racism can morph itself. Um, so it can go from those extremes that you saw what Dr. Smith was talking about to more sinister ways where it can affect you economically. Um, it can it can take entire families down through economic hardship and through not having representation and not having the experiences that it takes to get the right resources to live happily in the United States as we all want to. And so I'm gonna start it off talking about my grandmother. And I, I get kind of choked up when I talk about these things because um, it's part of my life. It's it's part of what grew me. It's part of the, my soul. And so um, you may experience some of that choked up witness with me, but I'm, I'm hoping that it can help inform you, inform the experience that you have by listening to uh, Dr. Smith and I. But my grandmother, um, she actually uh, went to Tuskegee University, graduated from Tuskegee University, and came back to Mobile, Alabama, where I grew up, and wanted to take her teaching degree and go into the Mobile um, public school system and start teaching. Well, obviously, giving it to my grandmother, they didn't give her the chance to teach in the Mobile County public school system. In fact, um, she could not use her degree, and she ended up um, working in different homes as a maid and, and you know, and, and picking up some uh, laundry work, that kind of stuff, where she could wash laundry and stuff like that. But during those experiences, though, my grandmother and my grandfather, they started saving up money and they started buying up property uh, around Mobile County and renting out homes and stuff like that. And then based on that, they were able to build a school. And in that same regard, they built that school off of the off of the um, the wickedness of her not being able to utilize her degree they built that school and then my grandmother actually became my kindergarten and first grade teacher after someone told her that she could not be a teacher and that's a powerful thing and that's why i say we are we are building ourselves off of the shoulders of those folks that came before us because my grandmother could have quit she could have stopped. She could have been the underdog and, and never pushed her and pushed forward. But because of her, she actually started my educational career. So I'll move on from that and talk about, so uh, my grandma's my first, my kindergarten, first grade teacher. I move into public schools. And that's where you start to see some of the way racism morphs. Racism morphs from where you can shoot a black person in the street or lynch a black person in the street to more of, okay, I've got to affect their economic viability. And that can start with going into terrible schools where you don't have the same resources to the same teachers, to the same great education. And then transitioning from um, going to public schools, I actually went to private schools. And, I, and it was amazing to me, the stark difference that I saw between going to the public schools and the private schools. And so in Alabama, after desegregation, what a lot of the schools in Alabama did, um, they, a lot of white families formed what they call academies. And what these academies did was because you had to uh, go to, uh, black and white kids had to go to school together, these academies are private schools and they didn't have to go by the same um, laws of segregation or desegregation. So these academies were all filled with white kids that their parents took them out of the public school so they wouldn't have to go to school with black kids. And I remember a pastor from um, the church that we went to, they started a school that was part of this academy system and they wanted my sister and I to come to that school and integrate that school. And so out of about 2,000 white kids, it was me and my sister. And I started that school in fifth grade coming out of public school. And I remember how tough it was, you know, not seeing anybody like me and really um, seeing the visceralness that you get from folks that say that you're not, you don't belong. You're not supposed to be here. I mean, it, it came up in so many ways of uh, of people asking me, did I live in a shack? To, um, you know, 
being called a nigger on a daily basis and you know and those things hurt right but i learned from my grandma years ago that you don't let those things stop you you use that to grow and you use that to um, engage this world and become a better person so i learned from that um, i learned from that push i learned from taking those experiences and driving toward you know, getting a better education so I uh, went from um, public school, went to college, got a degree, and in, in, ended up in corporate America and saw it morph again to where, okay, I've, I've got the list. I've got the certificates. I've got everything I need to be successful in this life, everything that folks say you need to be successful. And then it morphs again, right? Well, you know, you, you don't have enough of that resource or uh, you, you find out when you get into a corporate America that there's no representation for you. Um, you're, you, you go for a job interview and the person interviewing doesn't look like you and can't even connect with you on a cultural level. So they don't understand um, some of the, 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 the different differences between cultural uh, engagement and, and, and the diversity that you can bring uh, to uh, a product or, or resource when they're trying to deliver that to the public. So, I saw it in so many different ways where you didn't get the opportunities, where you didn't get a chance to get that promotion. It was it was always that excuse. And so the biggest thing you have to understand here is that racism morphs itself. And I remember my dad having that conversation with me and telling me that he's like, son, I'm gonna tell you now, and, and my dad was, I'm, I'm 43 years old now, and my dad was around the same age as me uh, when he had this conversation with me. And he told me, hey, you're going to have some experiences in life that you are not going to be able to uh, break through and be a part of something because of the color of your skin. And when those times come, you have to stand strong and fight through. And you know, he's telling me these things, and, and, and I was seeing some of that as I was growing up, but I didn't really understand how racism can be so sinister when it is under the surface, when it's not in your face, when I don't have to really tell you I don't like you. I could just not give you a job. I don't have to tell you I don't like you. I'll j I, I just want to give you a promotion. I don't have to tell you I don't like you. I just want to allow you to get toward resources like low low cost home loans and things like that right and so i've had to and the, the biggest thing i want you to understand is i've had to have that conversation with my son too and my dad had it when he was my dad had that with me when he was my age and i think that's the ridiculousness of racism that's how it permeates through life it changes and it morphs and 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 one of the biggest things you'll see in society is that people don't want to look at it. I mean, I, I hear stuff all the time like I don't see color. And um, I hear stuff all the time like, well, you know, if you bring diversity and equality into the workplace, don't you lose quality? And 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 it almost, you know, it's almost this visceral snap in my neck when someone said, so you, you're telling me because a, a different, a person of color comes into the workforce and has the same advantages and resources you have that somehow they won't provide the same quality of service you do, or they won't work as hard as you do. And 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 in my work life, I've had those, I've had to have those conversations around the gaps that we see and providing that diversity. And so one of the biggest messages that I want to leave with folks is as you see from Dr. Smith's story, as you see from my story, there are some things that align very much that you see the same racism work its way through but it changes and it morphs itself to still take advantage and marginalize people, right? It, and, and the only way that we can change this is if all of us look into our own hearts and souls and start having a conversation around why is racism still exist? Why does it? Look into your own soul and, and, and understand that from your soul, why does racism still exist? And start having conversations with relatives and friends because, you know, outside of what Dr. Smith and our ears hear, 
they're, you're hearing these conversations where people are saying things that completely like, you know, wow, I can't believe you just said that. And that's the, the that's the discussion that Dr. Smith and I want you to have with the people you're engaging with is, why are you thinking that way? Have you engaged with an African American or a person of color to understand, you know, their the, what they've gone through in life and engage with them and, and understood why um, why you feel that way about them and, and talk to them and really understand that more more times than not it's us. We and and you in the same in the in the same place, trying to one make sure our kids are successful, trying to make sure that we all have work and put food on the table, and then making sure that our kids can engage this world without having to go through what we're going through now as adults, and that, and that's ultimately what we want. And one of the biggest things I can say is I've seen. Uh, how racism can permeate through even just simple discussions around why Black Lives Matter. I've even had these discussions around, um, uh, even with some of my staff at work, of asking me, why why does Black Lives Matter have to be so prevalent um, in the community? And, 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 and why do we have to have these discussions? And why do we have to go to these diversity trainings? And and my and my answer always back to him is, you know, why are you asking me if you have to go to these different diversity trainings? Why do you are you asking me why do you want to get engage employees when I know I've heard from you specific things around racism that I know you need to deal with, and so that's why these things are in place. So that's my experience. Um, those are some of the things that I've gone through um, as an African-American. And I turn it back over to Dr. Smith. Thank you, Joseph. Because I'm hearing uh, Joseph's story. I just um, want to add a little bit more, more context because this really is about hearing a story. So I, I thought of the, just an example of my mother and father. So we grew up in the South. So my mother and father worked on farmland. My dad was like a cotton janitor and my mom, mother would work in, in the fields, um, you know, taking care of us. And, and here's an example of, of some of the experience. So what my mother did for us is she would put us at the end of the cotton row um, while she picks a row of cotton and come back to the end. So think about that. No babysitter. And, and so she watched over us at the end of the row. Um, and that sometime was like out in 100 degree weather because Arkansas was very hot. Both my parents, so we didn't come to Seattle till they actually were in their late 40s. So that means from their early years to about 40, they had no retirement system. They had no social security. They had nothing because they worked into a system. So that shows you how, you know, when they talk about blacks being 50% um, uh, behind economically, there, there is a really, really good example right there. So now they come to Seattle and, you know, they're in their late 40s. Um, it's that's like you know they had never catch up to someone who had the economic stability of buying a house or anything like that so as joseph was saying earlier um uh, racism demonized people racism marginalized people racism traumatized people uh, and so uh, when we talk about as joseph said black lives matter we're really talking about we want the uh, Black lives and people of color want the same thing as everyone else want, and that is that is the gift of life. And so, um, thinking about the importance of of why Black lives matter um, in our in our country, uh, and it's hard for me, you know, when I talk about Black lives matter, um, and I know Joseph, uh, I speak for Joseph as well. We're, we're talking about all people, 
that are marginalized and traumatized. Because here's one of the things that we know that when Black lives, black lives uh, experience equality, everyone else benefits from that as well. And that, that's really a, an important thing. I want to go back and talk a little bit about, um, which I, I am grateful for Joseph Sherry, that is, it starts with each one of us individually. Racism is rooted in the heart of humanity. Uh, as a, a, a person of, of, of God, who always God has been the source of my strength, is that uh, until people can really look at themselves and ask that deep question, as, as Joseph said, is, that, that this person deserves the gift of life as much as I do. And it doesn't have anything to do with your skin, but that we're all human beings. We're all creator of the almighty creator. Until uh, we can each look at each other from that perspective, only then can we, we begin to, um, you know, create some sense of, of, of equality for everyone um, in, this, in this world. But racism is deadly. Um, and I'm not talking about physical deadly. It's just deadly physically. We've seen that play itself out. But it's really deadly spiritually. Uh, because when we have racism in our hearts, uh, we do kill people. We, we, de we, we demonize them. And, and we traumatize them by, the, by the, um, the way that we treat them. So it's one of those things that it's a social ill. It continues it leads to poverty, it leads to homelessness, uh, criminalization, um, educational um, disparities, and, and, and poor health care. And again, we see in COVID-19 just the impact that it had on, I mean, I just like couldn't believe, you know, well, you know, I just, just sort of knew it, I shouldn't say I couldn't believe, it, but just the, I, the magnitude of it, the, to think about that, uh, think about sort of put me back in the place where um, you know, where I was growing up, you know, we didn't have a really neighborhood clinic, so we had to travel miles that morning that my mother took me to the doctor. Uh, uh, that was about 25, 30 miles from where we actually lived out, out in the woods, so to say. And then to have to sit all day just to get the, the health care, is, it's just, it's unbelievable in today's, today's time, but that, that still exists. I, was listening to a story where a young man said his mother was ill and he went to see about her and she had COVID and it took him like three hours. The hospital, nearest hospital was three hours away from where she lived, where she could get any kind of medical care. So racism, um, it's just really uh, devastating to our society and uh, most of all to humanity. And it, it really does impact us. Uh, So, um, so spiritually, uh, so I'm a person of God, and I grew, I grew up in the church. I grew up uh, reading the Bible, serving God. But one of the things that I found also growing up that uh, religion, I use the word religion, because religion is, was a way to oppress particularly Blacks. I grew up thinking that, uh, was told that there was a white God sitting in the sky with a white beard and was looking over us and, and everything that we did, if we did wrong, this God would come out to get us. And so we grew up with this real oppressive understanding of who God was. And that was a way really that was created by a, a white ideology to keep black people in, in, in place and in compliance with, um, the powers to be. It was really to maintain the power to be. So one of the things that I really um, um, challenged myself and, and my Black colleagues and others um, in Indigenous people is to really, is to get to know God for yourself. And I've had to do that in my life. I had to deprogram myself from this institutional God that was based on a white ideology and to really uh, live as the Marcus Board called it, to relearn Jesus for myself. And that gave me really a sense of freedom. And I think that it, that has been that power that has en enabled me to rise above uh, the injustices 
and to be and continue to fight for injustice for others who are experiencing um, uh, injustices in our world. So racism is a very um, devastating uh, experience. So I think Joseph and I will talk a little bit about uh, um, institutional and structural racism. And we'll just talk a little bit about, um, you know, structural uh, um, inequality is a system of, of privilege that's been created by institutions uh, with, within any, uh, economics. And, and these institutions include law, business practices, and government policies. They include education, they include healthcare, and even in our me media, um, they, those, uh, those things impact it. So, I, so I think, so the voice, what we have to do to, is to be able to change the narrative because the narrative that we keep hearing are, are those narratives that uh, perpetuate racism. And I think us collectively have to start changing uh, the narrative around racism. I, I believe that, you know, one of the things that there are amazing white people now, some people might not think that, but I do. Because you know what? I've had experience with amazing white people. One of the most powerful stories of my life, I worked at the King County Youth Center uh, when I first came, came to uh, Seattle, uh, 18 years old. And um, I'm not really sure I knew what I was doing. But this amazing judge, and I, he will always be in my heart, Judge Garvey, just sort of took me under his arms and guided me through. And when I got my, uh, I'd taken this test for, to work for this major employer, he was so amazing. He took me to the, ex the exam and, on my, and I got the job and, the, and he actually took me for my first day of orientation. And that's one example of a person who just walked alone. He walked alongside of one person and let me tell you, I was very afraid. I mean, here this little country girl <laughs> coming from the South and experienced all of these sort of evil, mean-spirited things. And then here's this judge of all people who's like, okay, I'm going to help her to get her foot uh, solid, to get her solid. And he just sort of just guided me and just, you know, helped me at, at the job, you know, he affirmed me and he saw the best in me. And I think that's, you know, when we started thinking about race, if each one of us would see the, the best of what's in each person, we can change this story. We have to change the narrative um, to say that we're all in this together and we're working together as a group of people, a community, a humanity to change racism. So structural racism uh, for me is really, is, it's the different individual forms of inequality, racism, sexism, um, xenophobia, um, misogyny. Did you know the list just goes on and on? And so each one of us can, can play a part in that. Joseph? Thanks, Dr. Smith. So, I, so you know, building on what Dr. Smith is saying, um, just like she's talking about that judge and how the judge reached out and pulled up and gave her opportunities to get on solid ground and, and 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 have her engage in the resources that we all need to be successful that's what we're looking for uh for my allies is to it when you see something say something and do something yeah. because that's the only way that we can break this structural racism when you see something say something and do something because silence lets folks know, even though uh, they know it's wrong, even though you know it's wrong, your silence will tell folks it's okay. I agree with you. Let's let's keep on, let's keep carrying on with the way things are, and that's how structural racism is able to permeate. Um, give me an example. Um, when I moved here in 2001, uh, my wife and I bought our first home in the Northwest out in Puyallup, Washington. And got tired of the commute driving back and forth from Seattle to Seattle. And so we were like, hey, we're going to have to sell this house and, and, and move in closer. And, you know, just like our friends had done, we put our house up for sale. 
and you know positioned all the furniture and all the kind of stuff to make sure it could sell sell well and you know you know doing all the curb appeal stuff right and you know folks would come in take a look and and um and is the house in on the uh, market for about a month and I remember um this it, this real estate agent was used to houses just going really quickly and he came to us and he said hey could you take the pictures, the pictures of your family and your family down? Can you take your pictures of Martin Luther King down? And we were like, what? Why, why do you want us to take, why, why do you want us to take those particular pieces down? And he was like, well, I think you'll have a better chance of selling your home in this area if you take those things down. And see, did you see it? it that's how racism seeps its way in, right? He didn't think that was a racist thing to tell uh, 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 a family that has pictures of their entire life on the walls and the respected leaders that you have, um, that you've grown up with, that have, that have told you to be strong and be better. He said, take all, take all those down, things down and devoid the home of any experience of your family so that we can sell this home. And so that's how we have to say, when you see something, say something and do something because that's, that's ridiculous. Right. And the unfortunate part is we did exactly what he asked us to do in our household in two weeks. That is how structural racism works. Right. And we have to destroy that at the level of working through society's um, issues of where how it can engage in selling a home, how it can engage in getting a low cost home loan. Right. How my grandfather, when he came back from World War II, couldn't use his GI Bill because of redlining. He, he couldn't buy homes in certain areas. And then the banks were providing loans in the areas that he could live in. So this all this time he spent in World War II, it was a waste of time. So those are the things that when Dr. Smith is talking about that structural racism, that's where we need ally help. That's where we need allies to come along with us and talk to city councils and say, hey, can you fix these issues from a legislative perspective in providing affordable housing? Can you fix these things from a legislative perspective to say, hey, how do we get the right resources in the right hand so we can prioritize it for black communities that hadn't had these resources in the past? And so those are the things that we really need. And that's the only way that structural racism is going to go away is if we join together in that way. One of the recent uh, uh, reports from Forbes magazine talked about the stimulus checks. And it talked about how um, white individuals receive their stimulus checks in May. Blacks and Hispanic particularly did not receive theirs until after. And even when they received and only about 69 to 63% of the people received those stimulus, stimulus checks at that point. So the people that needed them the most were, were the last to get them, and some still haven't received them. And I saw many of my uh, white friends putting on Facebook that they were giving their stimulus checks away, and that's why I'm basing the assumption on the people that needed them the least got them the first. Now, think about, I mean, that that's really a form of racism that's deeply rooted in our system, and that's what, sometimes what it, where it makes some of these uh, issues of racism so very difficult to get to. That's why it takes everyone working uh, uh, to look through the lens of, of, of racism, to look through our, our, our systems, to look for biases that uh, eliminate people and stop people from, from receiving, like Joseph said, um, equity in life. Uh, there's an issue around being uh, unbanked or underbanked. And so some people can't buy houses because some people can't get a bank account. Now, now some people are thinking, oh, that's unbelievable. There are many people, many people of color, Blacks, Indigenous, and other people who are not able to get a bank account. So if you don't have a bank account, guess what? You're not going to be able to get a, get a loan for your house. The CARES funds that was issued for... Um, uh, private uh, small businesses. They're estimating that 
a huge percent of small businesses will go out of business because they were they did not receive those loans. And so this this whole thing about racism is so prevalent. And there are so many laws and things that's on our books that uh, hinders and that, that are barriers that stop people from living uh, to the fullness of life. Um, we have a few more minutes. So I, I think to think about racism as a thought pattern, as Joseph said, that we, we take on, it's almost like... Um, deprogramming yourself. I think mean, we all have to, even us as, us as Blacks and other people of color, sort of deprogram ourselves and, and just get a fresh view of what it, what it means to be human and what it means to live collectively as, as a group of people. Really not being afraid to talk to people. And this is to my white colleagues and friends. I know that can probably be a very difficult conversation sometime with families and friends, but you're really a, the only one in the position to do it. Um, I was talking to um, um, one of my white friends uh, yesterday, and there's a group of um, our uh, white friends here in Brinson who have been uh, doing Black Lives Matter since George Floyd uh, got killed. They stand faithfully every Friday. And so I was just talking to uh, them about their work. I really appreciate. That's one way. And she said, we're just, we're going to stand. And that's been really powerful because that shows uh, us as a community that they care about us, that they don't believe that we're making trouble, that we're uh, trying to destroy our community. And one of the things that I pointed out is sometimes the system will hear, well, most of the time, the system will hear it from a white person before they're here from me. So when you as whites speak out about injustice against Blacks, Indigenous, and other people, they will hear it at a much greater level than they will from us. And so that's where I think one of the most powerful ways that our white colleagues, our friends can come along and support us. And you have access to systems that we don't always have access to. And look at those systems through the lens of, uh, of racism and ask that hard question. Am I participating in race, racist acts or is everybody, does everyone have access, as access to the laws and policies? I would so, also say, Dr. Um, Smith, too. I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Smith. I was just going to make one point because we had to wrap it up here. But I, I think the final thing that I want to say is being compassionate about the other. Um, that you're not afraid to stand up for those who are oppressed. Uh, because ultimately what happens to one of us affects us all at some point in our lives. So, uh, Joseph. I was just going to say, as Dr. Smith was saying, um, one of the greatest ways you can help us is come along beside us and engage the community. Engage your friends and engage your family. Um, because they'll listen to you far greater <laughs> our, our way before they'll listen to us, right? Um, because not only are you friends and family, but you look like them as well. And if they can hear and see you say things that th that Dr. Smith and I would say, they'll receive that much greater, in a much better light than if I was to say it to them. And so one of the biggest things I see us being able to um, accomplish together is we can tear down these structures if we all work to tear down these structures together. And I don't mean tearing down democratic norms, the structures that are put in place to make us a great country. I mean the structures that are built within those democratic structures that have tilted them in a, the wrong direction so that folks that look like us can't get access to resources. 
the structures or the whole structure doesn't need to come down. We need to rip out the pieces that shouldn't have been there in the first place. And that's where we need allies. That's where we need help. Okay, so we are at our time and you know, certainly we could go on and on with this conversation, but we'll be <laughs> in a breakout and we'll be glad to um, answer um, other questions. But what we've tried to do is just sort of give you um, a little bit of our story. I think that when we know each other, um, we're less threatened by each other. And I think we begin to realize that, you know, we're all the same. We're in the, you know, we're all after the, the same thing in life. So uh, we have been really grateful for the opportunity to share with you uh, this afternoon. And uh, we're delighted to come back at our, our breakout session to answer additional questions that may come up. Thank you. Joseph, you have anything final to say? No, that was good, Dr. Smith. I'm good. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Smith, I just want to thank you for your leadership and your story today. And uh, Joseph Todd, I want to thank you for your leadership and your story today. And I just want to encourage all of us to take a minute and just kind of breathe with the, these stories and with what you heard. Uh, maybe take a few minutes and write a few notes down if you want to, or just sit in silence. Um, I just think it's important for us to take a moment and, and breathe into this. And then I'll, I'll get us started on a, a time with Rachel and, and uh, Becky as well. So just take a minute. So friends, our, our next group is led by Rachel Tabor Hamilton of Circles of Color with Becky Clark. Raised in a bicultural heritage of Chacon First Nation and 17th century Protestant immigrants, the Reverend Rachel Tabor Hamilton has a lifelong passion for cross-cultural communication, preservation of traditional life ways and folk traditions, social diversity and ethnic ministries. Rachel is currently Rector of Trinity Episcopal Church in Everett, Washington. She serves on the Anglican Indigenous Network, an international community of Indigenous leaders committed to education and advocacy for a post-colonial world. She is co-founder and coordinator for Ethnic Ministries Circles of Color, BIPOC Network, in the Episcopal Diocese of Olympia. Becky Clark was born and raised in Sitka, Alaska. She married a Coast Guardsman 51 years ago, and they were stationed across the country while raising two sons. She is now the proud grandmother to a seven and three-year-old. Her indigenous work with the Episcopal Church began in the 1980s while stationed in Oregon. As a layperson, her work involved local, regional, national, and international indigenous ministries. Rachel and Becky, thank you for being here with us. How can we hear you and stand with you? Thank you very much, Terry, for the opportunity to be with you and with past understanding. Uh, and also thank you to Dr. Linda Smith and also to Joseph Todd for their sharing. 
Uh, we're very honored to be with you today and have this opportunity to be part of this conversation. Uh, one of the things that I want to do uh, before we turn to Becky's story is set some context for that story that is a broad context of European colonialism. Every single indigenous person that you will ever meet in your lifetime has been affected by historic colonialism. There are in this country, for example, 535 recognized by the federal government recognized tribes. There are many more that the federal government has not recognized because those recognitions involve obligations by the federal government to people that they have conquered, whether through treaty or land acknowledgement claims. This affects people all over what many indigenous people refer to as Turtle Island, which is Canada, the United States, and South America, that all for us represent this international, inter-sovereign states of people, indigenous people on this landmass. So when we talk about it, we're talking about kindred all across several nations. And we're also involving people uh, globally who represent other colonized nations such as Hawaii, which is itself a sovereign nation, and Australia and the Aboriginal peoples, the Maori of New Zealand, and the indigenous people of places like Taiwan, and the indigenous people of Norway, the Sami. So when we're talking about it all, even though we have such diversity within our representation and sovereignty, we also have many things in common because of that history of colonialism. One of the things that we refer to when we're talking about a whole series of legal principles and also a particular form of historic Christianity that enabled and promoted genocide of indigenous peoples. When we talk about that today, we refer to all of that as the doctrine of discovery. The idea that there was no one here when in fact the most recent studies of Arctic ice core samples and very careful discernment of the use of land mass can demonstrate today that in the early 1400s before European contact on the Turtle Island, there were an estimated 60 million indigenous people who were cultivating at least 58 million hectares of land across that landmass, which means that within a hundred years from 1492 until the mid six, you know, 1500s, we had a loss of 90% indigenous populations in Turtle Island due to the impact of diseases that were introduced. We went from 60 million and lost 58.5 million indigenous peoples before we even get to the 1600s and the England bringing its own colonial representatives to these shores in the eastern part of this country, which is why they often thought nobody lived here because so many had already been devastated. The loss of that many hectares of cultivated land resulted in a very quick growth of undergrowth and storied trees that absorbed in massive amounts of carbon from the air, causing the little ice age that impacted Europe. So we've been looking at ways that a colonial sense of use of environment and peoples has now for 400 years impacted climate change. So that's serves as context for even today, the way that indigenous peoples have experienced relationship to land as one of essentially deprivation. And also as one in which a European worldview saw indigenous peoples as part of the flora and fauna that could either be extracted or eliminated if it wasn't useful. And we weren't considered people. It took legal precedence over many years to even establish that we were people. And for indigenous people in the United States, we didn't have legal precedent to be seen as people until 1846. 
So we have what's called intergenerational trauma through not only the outright genocide of indigenous peoples, but also through the stripping away of indigenous culture. And that intergenerational trauma and that history sets the tone for Becky's story. And I would like to invite her. She's respected and really beloved elder in the Klingit community and among indigenous peoples here. And she's very humble about that, but her elder <laughs> status uh, is something that we really cherish. So Becky, I invite you to share your story. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you to the Paths to Understanding community for allowing me this time. First of all, my greeting to you in Clinkit. My name is Saki Khan. I was born to the Ravens, the Luknahadi, my mother's adoptive clan. I was born for the Eagles, the Kogwantan, my father's clan. I actually began this talk about residential schools and moving from individual to intergenerational trauma last year. I was in my third edition of a talk entitled Wholeness and Separation for a retreat weekend. It was my third edition of the title. And I knew it wasn't going to be easy, but neither did I imagine actually writing three different talks. This is not the one I gave. This year, it seemed to be the right time to finish this healing process. The talk covered, among other things, the evil and sinfulness we carry and the repentance needed to resolve it and ways to accomplish that. During this time, memories triggered by children in cages on our borders mired me in the anger and frustration I continued to carry where my mother is concerned. That will become clearer shortly. Before I get to that, I will begin with a short history of residential schools because I've found that many people don't know that what residential schools are or how they began. Or if they are familiar with it, it may be because of recent Canadian news. This is a very edited version of a long history. Beginning in the 1600s, John Eliot began, quote, praying towns, end quote, in an effort to separate Indigenous people from their communities. Jesuits, however, found out it was all too difficult to change the minds of the adults, and so decided instead to target the children. As the European invasion of this country expanded, among the things the government did was to take Indian children from their families and homelands and place them, often with strong parental objection, into residential schools. This they did to destroy their culture, destroy their language, and, quote, civilize them, to be more acceptable to their white, sometimes Christian, subjugators. On March 3rd, 1819, the Civilization Fund Act was passed and, quote, ushered in the era of assimilation policies leading to the Indian school boarding era. The act directly spurred the creation of schools, putting forward the notion that native culture and language were to blame for what was deemed the country's Indian problem, end quote. Between 1860 and 1978, there will be 357 boarding schools. Between 1869 and 1870, the schools became formalized with the grants peace policy and about one third of the schools were turned over to various Christian organizations. The schools were staffed by, quote, persons of good moral character, end quote who were charged to with introducing Indian children to the habits and arts of culture while encouraging them to abandon their traditional language, cultures, and practices. In 1879, the first off-school, off-reservation schools were established at Carlisle, Pennsylvania, founded by General Richard Henry Pratt, who said, quote, a great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one, and that high sanction of his destruction has been an enormous factor in promoting Indian massacres. In a sense, I agree with him 
but only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian and save the man. General Pratt pointed out that off-reservation schools were needed because, number one, children would find it difficult to run away, and two, the assimilation they sought would be reversed if the children were allowed to go back home. Residential boarding school population grew from 20,000 in 1900 to nearly 61,000 by 1925. In 1924, the federal government granted citizenship to the people, though that really didn't have much of an impact on the continued removal of their children. By 1926, nearly 83% of Indian children of school age were attending residential boarding schools. They say that in 1978, the schools were closed. However, the one that's still in my hometown of Sitka, Alaska, called the Mount Edgecombe Boarding School is still operating. Many of the smallest villages in Alaska cannot support any kind of higher education, so families send their children away for nine months a year. 1978 was also the year the American Religious, American Indian Religious Freedom Act was signed into law. I did not attend residential schools, but I too have had its effects. I was a part of the generation of my people who did not teach their children the language, the traditions, or ceremonies. And it was decades before I heard from an elder that they did this to protect us from what they went through. This included punishment for speaking their own language. In many cases, the only language they had. They were punished for, or possibly incarcerated for performing rites and ceremonies. They were fined or jailed or taken for taking fish or deer out of season. Hunger does not have a season. The impact of enforced schooling includes low self-esteem, no sense of safety, becoming institutionalized, having difficulty forming relationships. It means the loss of parental power, loss of the family, and the near destruction of extended families. Traditions, language, and ceremonies were lost, as was their sense of community. It resulted in the near destruction of the tribal structure by depleting its tribal enrollment, and many children died. About 20 years ago, I poo-pooed the idea claimed by an indigenous priest and professor that all indigenous people have PTSD. It took a few years, but I have come to believe that this is true. Besides Native Americans, post-traumatic stress, stress and transgenerational trauma is documented in Holocaust descendants, slave descendants, war survivors, refugees, survivors of interpersonal abuse, and many others. Quote, PTSD is widespread in nature these are shared experiences, collective suffering with the malicious intent of perpetrators, leading to the loss of identity and meaning, end quote. It has been observed to cause high maternal stress, which weakens family functioning, leading to deviant behavior of children, such as delinquency, depression, antisocial behavior, acting out, guilt, anxiety, which can lead to mistrust, isolation, loneliness, substance abuse, violence, microaggression, higher mortality rates, physical and sexual abuse, which in turn cause resistance and stigmatism if and when treatment is sought or possibly misdiagnosed with behavioral or educational disabilities. And of course, lack of treatment causes its own consequences. These issues have been, so, have been shown at a cellular level, epigenetic, gene modified with maternal trauma during pregnancy. So imagine please, you are five years old, your parents have died, you have only your grieving siblings for comfort, you are taken to a strange place 
by strange people. They have a strange language. You don't understand them and they certainly don't understand you. And the only people who do understand you are your brothers and they won't even let you be with them or speak with them. Sounds like a Twilight Zone episode to me. This was how my mother entered the residential school system. In territorial Alaska, Native children were, were routinely removed from their families and placed in residential schools. In my mother's case, she was not taken from her family. Her family was taken from her. She was born in the small central Alaskan Athabascan community of Rampart in November 1919. I just found out this year that my grandfather died in April of that year. Was this a source of maternal trauma, a trigger? Mom had four older brothers and two younger ones. Around 1924, their cabin burned to the ground with her mother in it. Mom and her brothers were placed in a Catholic orphanage. These six grieving children were not allowed to stay together. Those in charge did not want to risk that they would speak Athabascan, their first and only language. I know she was shuttled to two different facilities and ended up in one of the Episcopal boarding schools. My mother didn't talk much about it. My older sister, however, has gotten to know one of her classmates and she has been willing to share a story or two. She said they spent most of their time working and they were always tired and they were always hungry. She worked in the kitchen and one night after work, she had stolen a chicken and when she and mom hid in the barn and ate the whole thing. My mother was working, my mother's work, excuse me, was in housekeeping and preparing for guests. She became a meticulous person at setting a table with immaculate linens and just the right foods for every occasion. Everything in her life was regimented and precise. My sister was doing research for something else when she ran across some paperwork that listed my mother's name. It listed her as an inmate of the school. Yes, an inmate. In his book, The Four Vision Quests of Jesus, Bishop Stephen Charleston says, quote, oppressive cultures name their prey, end quote. By calling their victims something else, it relieves them of the guilt they might feel regarding their abuse and dehumanization of their victims. Does that give you an idea of what these children had to go through? My sisters and I could not live up to my mother's expectations. We never washed things correctly. We never ironed things correctly. We certainly never folded things correctly. Everything had to be done in a certain way. On the other hand, my brothers could do no wrong. They were footloose and fancy free until they were old enough to do subsistence fishing and hunting. My mother and I butted heads literally from the day I was born. When she went into labor, she knew that if she went to the hospital, the doctors would have me delivered on their terms. My mother had her own terms. I was born at 12.05 a.m. at home on her birthday. After having two children of my own, I can only ask, more maternal trauma? I would venture to say that there was certainly infant trauma. I spent my first week in the hospital. Having mentioned my children, I'm sure you would ask them, if you would ask them, they would say too that I was very strict, I was overprotective, I was rules and regulations, I was law and order. By the time they're in their early teens, and I'm about 35, I have a most startling revelation about my mother. I realize that she didn't know how to be a mother. She didn't know how to be affectionate. She didn't know how to nurture. After all, what do single white celibate nuns stationed in God-forsaken wilderness of central Alaska know about raising children? let alone native children. I had always wondered why we were not that portrayal of the 1950s and 1960s television family. 
And yes, it took me until I was 35 <laughs> to begin to understand my mother. And I was still learning how to be a mother myself. We still disagreed on things, but I had learned to be more tolerant with her. I learned to make my point, my point while allowing her to have hers. And occasionally I was able to change her mind. I am so very grateful for our daughter-in-law. She is an awesome mother to our grandchildren. And I could not ask for a more patient and understanding helpmate for my son. She is, after all, an elementary school teacher and very patient. With her help, the anger and frustration episodes he can experience that sadly remind me of me or my mother are less frequent and less intense. She is strong enough to stand up to him and show him and explain how his negative behavior affects their children. I thank her for that every opportunity I can. One difficulty of my re-education is coming to terms with my anger and frustration with the church that I grew up in and love for the abuses that they allowed or committed. How do I forgive myself for blindly following and accepting the teachings of a church and a society, excuse me, which allows such things to happen? How do I forgive my mother for not knowing what she didn't know? and therefore was not able to pass that knowledge on to her sons and daughters. How do I deal with the frustration that I know nothing about my mother's Athabascan heritage? I was nine years old before I met a whole clan of aunts and uncles and cousins I never knew existed. I am only beginning to know them and rarely do I understand their ways, nor they mine. I know I have a long way to go and I have come a long way. One of the mantras I have posted in several places and found helpful to remind me and to be gentle with the memories of my mother as well as with myself comes from Rumi. Whether the guest of sadness, tenderness, rawness, vulnerability, grief, or loneliness appear today, open the grace door hidden in the center of your heart, invite these friends in for tea, for they have something very important to share. Thank you for your kind attention. Rachel. Thank you, Becky, very much for sharing that. It, it is a way to give folks um, an in, in to just one example of millions uh, of every Indigenous person you meet will have a story similar to Becky's or have that as part of heritage and parental story. Uh, and it continues to influence uh, how Native people experience their own cultures today. Uh, and in my case, it is this constant quest, and it will be throughout my entire life, of reclamation, of, of trying to find the snatches and tidbits of my grandfather's culture and my mother's culture. One of the uh, one of the things then that makes it so complex when when white allies or non natives uh, want to have relationship with indigenous peoples in their area to know and be aware of the already the the history of mistrust and the history of not only then cultural genocide and stripping away, but then to have this very weird phenomenon that American identity and its sense of romanticized history and genesis really comes at the cost of the, the genocide of indigenous people that's not acknowledged. And there, it's in fact romanticized. And so it, the same thing, the same people that are, are kind of vilified and seen as non-people, qualities and attributes of them are lifted up and romanticized in American culture such that it's okay for white children to play cowboys and Indians and dress like Indians, but it's not okay for Indian people to do, to dress like Indian people and have that be accepted as normative. So it's this very strange messed up relationship uh, with even what people think indigenous people are like. For example, one assumption is that most indigenous people in the United States live on reservations, when in fact, almost 80% live in dense urban centers and are called urban Indians. 
In fact, here in Seattle, we have the Chief Seattle Center, which is a native run initiative for assisting homeless native people in Seattle. And we have a kind of a, a, a vast opportunity within our urban centers to be doing indigenous outreach and relationship building. And, but we also in Washington have this unique reality of multiple reservations and unique nations of indigenous people. So Becky and I often will, will be approached by people who are parishes who are interested to develop and, uh, relationships with their local tribal folks and they wonder how to do that. And given sort of this, this explicit and tender history, uh, it, it is a complex, it is complex. There, there's no easy way to enter into a relationship. But, but if you do, <laughs> then there are many things that are very important for effective advocacy. And of course, the very first thing is, is to be aware of what you do and don't know. How, how do you know what you don't know? We wanna give you a little taste of that. We think we maybe have a little bit, but, but to also be aware of where your assumptions are and what dominant culture has taught you about indigenous people. And the piece of it is I wanna give you four common pitfalls to, to really try to avoid. And then also four things that you can be, be advocating for and working for with social justice with almost any indigenous person you encounter. And then to frame those two things, pitfalls and advocate pieces is, is this, I call it educate yourself, be ready and bold to relate, be ready to advocate and be ready to appreciate. So let's unpack that a little bit. Some of the common foot, uh, pitfalls are, is that dominant culture folks can think that since they read a lot of Westerns, they have a sense of what's going on for indigenous people. <laughs> or because they opened up a textbook in high school and read one chapter out of 80 that had to do with American history and indigenous people, that they have a sense of indigenous people. So it really means that we have to educate our allies and, and allies need to be interested in doing that. Uh, so one of the things is when, we, when allies first approach indigenous persons, the thing that you don't wanna do, common pitfall, is talk about your 32nd grandma who was indigenous. <laughs> you don't wanna be making those claims of identity because it's already historically a challenged issue for indigenous people because of the approach of doctrine discovery and also what's called blood quantum. Native identity is in complex and important and a piece of trauma because of the influence of the doctrine of discovery and the government. So don't begin by saying how much you, you know, admire indigenous culture because that's a gateway to appropriation and that will not garner trust. So, don't say how Indian you are. Don't say how much you love what you're seeing <laughs> uh, and, or appreciate it or wish you had some of that culture. Uh, and then don't ask about um, sort of native cultural life ways right off the bat. Uh, one of the educational models that indigenous people use is with children in traditional settings is just to let them be with them and listen and, and learn by observation. And the dominant culture system is so much like uh, treating kids as empty vessels that need to be filled, that they're used to asking questions to be fulfilled. <laughs> when in fact, in indigenous models, exactly the opposite, don't ask questions, just watch and be quiet. <laughs> and just watch and relate and be quiet uh, and be with them and you'll learn a lot. And when they see that attitude, they'll say more. And uh, don't ask about blood quantum. Don't say, how much Indian are you? Don't do it. <laughs> because again, that's a piece of historic trauma that's, that's related to. And uh, then also don't appropriate, appropriate native items and use them culturally. For example, don't go to the antique store and get a old rattle that was probably stolen and appropriated in some other way and use it yourself in your home out of context. Uh, we see a lot of appropriation happening through new age 
kind of stuff and you can walk into a new age store and see some dream catchers made out of rabbit fur and see some weird plastic tomahawks and <laughs> just just don't do it don't even touch it <laughs> whether it's unique or not um, and certainly don't talk to an indigenous person about your wonderful native collection of stuff <laughs> or the museum you went to and saw wonderful stuff because museums are notorious for appropriation so now things that we can do as to be to encourage good allyship is to be aware of what are those top social justice concerns that every indigenous person, no matter where they are in the globe, uh, <laughs> will have these in common. And one of those has to do with resource extraction, <laughs> global consumerism and economics continues to vie for indigenous lands that even governments have said, these are set aside for indigenous people. And in this country, you just have to go to Navajo land and look at uranium extraction and uranium deposit pilings and how those have affected the health of indigenous people and continue to this day to even employ Navajo people to their own detriment as only one example of many. Resource extraction uh, takes away resources from native people and native rights. Another area for social justice concern that's very dear to Native people is the missing and murdered Indigenous women in the United States and Canada. That whole phenomenon is related to resource extraction and what are called the establishment of man camps. Those men who are actually the workers for resource extraction, whether it's fracking or oil, will set up man camps very proximate to Native country and women go missing and it's an epidemic proportion. The other thing to be aware of as an advocate is for native health care. An example is in Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Navajo land right now with COVID-19. As part of most treaty negotiations, we call them negotiations, they weren't really that negotiated, but the federal government is obliged to provide health care. The Indian healthcare network established by the federal government is very much underserved, underfunded, and under-resourced. And that has really affected the disproportionate amounts of Native people who have contracted COVID-19 and died. So looking, being aware of the, those needs for advocacy. Becky mentioned the epidemic portions of suicide due to the results of intergenerational trauma and the need for greater mental health care and advocacy for that. And finally, land and water rights are intimately connected to land use by Native people. But what they, what they don't do is fight for land and water rights just for themselves, which is a dominant culture way. But to say, we need to preserve this, not just for ourselves, but for others. When I was at Standing Rock and watching the, the, peop the Native people trying to communicate with the security forces that were standing there in front of them, I was shocked at how willing those forces were to do tremendous violence against American citizens and calling them insurgents when they had no weapons, were using no violence, and no even words of violence. So, a lot of advocacy has to do with understanding that it's not about Indigenous people asking for something that no one else can have, but asking for the preservation of something simply for the benefit of the land and recognizing the personhood of the earth and of rivers and of resources, preserving for their own generation and their own people and all people. So that is a, another way to enter in through echo justice uh, into relationships and asking your local tribes what their social justice issues are. And for some here in Washington, it's still seeking federal recognition. Terry, how are we with time? You're doing very well. You've got about 10 more minutes. Thank you. <laughs> so it's that, it's that self-education. It is a, a desire and a passion to relate, but to be humble in that and to uh, challenge oneself to get beyond tourism, a tourist relationship with indigenous people. And again, to just sit down quietly, watch, observe, 
uh, and, and know Indigenous people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and then be prepared to be part of advocacy. One of the reasons that Standing Rock advocacy was effective with, uh, for example, in the, in the Episcopal Church, it's very important not to go in with that passion and desire to support and advocate uh, as, a, as a lone gunman. You'll want to go in and do exactly what the Indigenous people are asking of you to do. Uh, when Pardon me. Uh, Father John Flober was the Episcopal Church on, uh, rector on Standing Rock and at one of the churches there. And he invited clergy from all denominations to come and be part of a specific social action during that whole time. And he invited us all. We came, we had a training, and one of the most important things was it's got to be nonviolent. You're going to have to use the values of the local indigenous people. You're going to do exactly what they tell you, and you're only going to do this. <laughs> so it was very prescribed. It had the permission of the elders and the native people, and we did exactly that. And I'll, I'll never forget um, encountering a traditional medicine person uh, there and and he was uh, doing a, a medicine song with drum and I asked him I was wearing exactly what I'm wearing now <laughs> and I asked him if he would say a blessing over me and it, and it's that even though I have indigenous identity I'm a, ha, standing here as not a member of his tribe. I am representing as white. I am representing a Christian church. <laughs> and I am asking him with all humility, would he bless and pray for me? And, and that giving indigenous people the opportunity to relate back to you um, in inequality and recognizing what they can give. One of the things that many denominations will do is ask an indigenous tribe, what do you need? What can we do for you? Rather than recognizing how much tribal people and nations can do for the community at large. In fact, up um, north of us here with, the, with uh, certain Salish groups, they actually give community grants to local Washington businesses that are committed to pres uh, environmental preservation and justice and education. So they have a lot that they can give. It's not a patronizing top-down relationship. <laughs> and to, to recognize the gifts, the skills, the uniqueness, and be prepared and willing and ready to study about the unique tribal identities of, the, of that diversity that we mentioned up front. So educating oneself, being ready to relate, being ready to advocate, and then knowing the difference between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation. <laughs> so, so that you're, we're not making the mistakes again and again about appropriation, which are still so ingrained as to be taken for granted. For example, people get a little up in arms around the sports mascot issue. But I would pose to you, what would it be like, would anyone consider having the San Francisco Chinamen as a team or the New York Jews as a team? And yet we have Cleveland Indians. Why is that okay? Because we're so thoroughly consumed as indigenous people into American identity that it's a default position. We need to deconnect that and reconstruct a relationship of equity. So thank you again for uh, listening to both of us. And uh, in our opportunity for breakout, we have more that we could share about <laughs> uh, local Washington tribes and ways to relate and talk a little bit more about the impact of doctrine discovery and how it's really alive very much today in legal precedent and resource extraction, what we can really do practically as allies to help with that. So we welcome any questions further uh, in that breakout session, if that's interesting to you. And thank you again for your time and kindness. Rachel and Becky, thank you so much for the wisdom of your stories, your sharing and your leadership. There's so much that uh, comes up 
for our following on break on breakouts. Let's all take a moment and uh, try to embrace what we've heard and come back in about a minute. Thank you. Terry Kylo will lead us now in a brief reflection on authentic and active allyship. Terry. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. And um, I'm gonna share a little bit about some things I've learned about being an ally. And uh, I wanna be clear that um, I'm still learning about uh, what allyship is and what it, what it means. and. Uh, and, and so I'm just learning along with all of you, but I've learned a few things over the last five or six years, especially. And I wanna start off with a little picture here. Um, this is from a, 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 pro, a protest, a public demonstration uh, against the, the Muslim ban as it was first proposed a number of years ago. And look at all the people there. Look at all the folk in that, in that picture. Um, you've got Jewish folk and you've got Christians, you have Buddhists, you have Hindus, you have, uh, several atheists and agnostics. You've got people from all over Western Washington um, standing together in that space who were called there really at pretty short notice. It was just only a couple of days, but all of the networks and relationships that had been built over the course of years came uh, together to allow this many people to come together at short notice in Seattle. And it was just extremely powerful all the allies standing there with the Muslim community in that moment, um, having a unified message and being willing to take their time, not only to stand there, but to get there and to have the relationships to help those relationships, come, that, that moment come together. So what, there's a lot of words for what we're talking about in this little presentation. There's the word ally. There's active, authentic allyship. There is um, uh, active, there's, there's just authentic allies. There's Accomplice is a word that is sometimes used. Mutual partner is a word that is sometimes used. Why are there so many words? Well, there's so many words in part because people in the dominant culture tend to make some mistakes. And let's just talk about those right now. Um, first, some things that, that allyship or authentic active allyship isn't. Um, it is not self-claimed. So just because you put on a safety pin doesn't mean that you're an ally. Just because you come to meet with a group doesn't mean that you're an ally. Um, you don't get to claim self-allyship. It is something that is a, a status that is recognized by a, a, a community that sees you as someone that is helpful to them in their fight for uh, equality and justice and equity. And, uh, and so it's not self-claimed. Uh, but a lot of people in the dominant, the dominant culture, in fact, try to make it self-claimed. Um, sometimes people in the dominant culture um, use allyship as a search for purity, as a way to kind of expunge, you know, whatever uh, negative thoughts they may have about themselves with regard to race. Um, sometimes people in the dominant culture try to maintain or increase our status by being recognized as allies. And of course, um, that's just the same old game 
that the dominant culture always asks us to play, which is that we have to constantly be competing for status with one another. And lastly, it's, it's not an inoculation from the benefits of one's own privilege. Um, it just simply isn't. It, uh, just because I have been recognized as an ally to the Muslim community doesn't mean that I have not benefited from the fact that my dad got an FHA loan when others didn't. Um, and so it's really important um, for, for me to recognize that active allyship is not and cannot be an inoculation from having to look at the way I benefit from systemic and institutional racism all around me and from the kind of work that I have, still have to do uh, with myself. So some, some things that I wanna say about allyship that I've, I've also learned is that really it's about love and leadership. But love of course is a difficult word um, is, is it often is reduced to simply feelings. So love is the willingness in my view to take a risk so that oneself and neighbors can experience shalom, peace, salam, shanti, etc. So it's not just about feelings, it's about risk taking. Next, the, the being an active, a, a, active ally is about leadership. It's about engaging a situation with your authentic self so that all may be more authentic to themselves. So it's about working in the public space. So authentic active allyship includes risking self and one's status to dismantle systems of oppression. And, and risking is tough. Risking sometimes, and we all have to kind of choose at various times what kind of risk we can take. But, but it, it, it means putting yourself out there in ways where you may be questioned, where you may have people say to you, well, hey, why are you saying these things? Why are you bothering me with this uncomfortable information? Don't you know what, that you're tearing down the system that benefits you? You're going to hear a lot of those things if you're working as an, as an active, authentic ally. Next, uh, to be an, an authentic, active ally means to be constantly investigating your own motivations. And, and just like trying to have some honesty about like, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? So, because there are many, many times when it's easy to kind of get into it for the wrong reasons. And eventually that's gonna make you, if, it's, if, it's not, if you're not clear about your motivations, it's gonna make you a bad ally. Next is that being an ally is a lifelong process of reforming one's heart and attitude and actions. And, and so I just wanna say like, uh, people sometimes assume that because I've been working as an ally of the Muslim community for five years that I've worked through all my Islamophobia. And the fact is, is that I haven't. I still have to continually work that through, work through um, other kinds of racism that, that is within my heart that I benefit from in the larger society. And so I'm still being confronted with that and sometimes lose sleep over that process. Next, it's about educating ourselves about what impacts marginalized communities and what effective responses are to those, to those things that are impacting them. And that involves research and listening to thought leaders. It involves a lot of work um, to, to um, really um, study what, uh, what seems to be effective out there and modify your own behaviors and actions to do that. Next, it's really important as we're acting as allies, once we've been recognized as such, to assess the effectiveness of our words and actions and attitudes. So for instance, every time I get through working with, uh, with the Muslim community, I always ask, how did I disadvantage you today? I always ask that question because I wanna understand the ways uh, that, that, that my actions and words may have been helpful, but also evaluate the ways in which they may not have. And I want you to know that I've lost some sleep uh, when the answer is that, yes, you did disadvantage us and here's how. And lastly, we got to practice as, as authentic active allies, good self-care, because it doesn't do another community any good at all to have an active ally and then all of a sudden have us burn out because we're not taking care of ourselves adequately. There are pressures that will come upon you as an ally that you've not recognized perhaps before. And it's extremely important that you take the time to, to think about that, to learn about that, to pray about that, to get the kind of support that you need to continue so that you can be the kind of authentic active ally that you wanna be. So that's just a little brief introduction of what I've learned so far. And now I'm gonna turn it back to, to John. Thank you, Terry. We have heard these stories and felt their impact. There is so much to take in 
to give us all a moment to breathe in these stories, we turn now to Imam Jamal Rahman for a spiritual practice. Brother Jamal is a part of the core team that planned this event. Thank you so much, Brother John, and thank you so much, dear panelists, for your very heartfelt presentations. So many uh, feelings, thoughts, insights, and how beautiful if we allow these all to settle uh, and perfume our hearts and then allow the right action to emerge by itself. I'm simply talking about the uh, practice we have been doing, uh, the practice of silence, authentic silence. You know, there's no such thing as a Muslim silence, a Hindu silence, a, a Jewish silence. It's just silence. Just a few metaphors. I love metaphors and poetry. Uh, a hamster in a cage running back and forth. Lots of motion. But is that fruitful? Maybe, maybe not. Compare that to a hen sitting on an egg seemingly doing nothing, but maybe being very productive. So just a few insights about silence. Every tradition says, no matter who you are, what you do or you don't do, if you really want to be of benefit to yourself and to society, please practice silence regularly. And silence, I'm quoting Rumi now. Rumi says, silence is not the absence of sound. It is the absence of the little self. I, 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 me, me, me. He goes on to say, silence is the language of spirit. Everything else is a poor translation. Be silent so that the Lord who gave you language may speak. For as he fashioned a door and a lock, she also made a key. One last metaphor. Doesn't matter whether you have a religion or no religion. We humans are like fish thrashing and quivering on the banks. And we need from time to time to dive into those oceans of silence. So we become renewed, refreshed, rejuvenated. Okay, enough talk. Please close your eyes. Become restful. And then simply focus on your nostril. And be present with your breath as you inhale. And as you exhale. Just this much. If it pleases you, if it works for you, as you inhale, you can silently say love and intent to bring in all the love of the cosmos inside of you. As you breathe out, you can silently say peace and feel and intend for peace to radiate out of you.
And now gently, as I do a chant, ever so gently, opening your eyes and being open to what is called the global presence. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. And gently opening your eyes and take your time. Thank you. Maybe one more real deep breath for everyone. Thank you, Brother Jamal. This event is sponsored by Northwest Interfaith, Paths to Understanding, the Interfaith Community Sanctuary, Call of Compassion Northwest, Circles of Color, and Sky Urban Empowerment and Transformation Center. If you'd like to offer some financial support for these events, we are posting a link for that in the comments section.